Julian Assange once remarked how surprised he was at how rare courage was, much rarer than intelligence. Uh, yet without it, we're not truly alive. We're just breathing in and out. If wars can be started with lies, he said, peace can be started with truth. And he identified the media as being complicit. They'd become propagators of lies. Working in the newsroom as I was during the so-called war on terror, it was almost impossible to question the war on terror. It was treasonous because the implication was you don't support our troops, you're supporting the terrorists. And in my view, we were creating terrorists. When I became aware that this uh, young Australian had made it his mission to take on the whole political media juggernaut, I was in awe but I also was very afraid for him. He was without a doubt brilliant and courageous and he was going to apply that brilliance and courage in an attempt to make the world a better place, for there to be peace, not just endless wars, where the deaths of civilians are minimally collateral damage. So having set up a way for whistleblowers to upload material anonymously, he soon attracted of course, the biggest case of leaked material ever and set about establishing another first, a collaboration with media organisations around the world and a network of individuals, individual experts around the world to verify the authenticity of the documents and to assist in the redaction of names and to identify and uh, write stories. So it was after the 2010 releases that Stuart proposed he be awarded the Sydney Peace Medal for his enormous service to human rights, to society and in recognition of his courage. The risk to his safety was clear. He had taken on the most powerful government in the world. He had attracted the biggest leak ever and his networked media machine was spewing out tens of thousands of reports around the world. The 2010 releases we all know, revealed war crimes, large numbers of unreported civilian deaths and how US foreign policy and diplomacy were used to prosecute endless over their wars, as uh, American commentators called them. In this same year, a relentless vilification campaign commenced and his extradition sought by Sweden, which refused to guarantee that they'd not onward extradite him to the United States. Julian knew that he was being investigated by a grand jury. He sought and was granted refuge by Ecuador and spent seven years in the London embassy. When I visited him in the embassy in 2013, he told me that he fled to the embassy not once, but twice, because the first time the ambassador was away. In contravention of international law, he was dragged out of the embassy by the UK police, ostensibly for jumping bail, but the UK and the new regime in Ecuador was simply doing the bidding of the US. He's now spent over three years in Belmarsh uh, prison while the US extradition request and appeals proceed through the legal system. Much is made of the decision to prosecute by Trump in contrast to Obama, but the indictment is for the 2010 releases. The decision to proceed uh, with an indictment occurred following the release of Vault 7 in 2016, and former CIA director Mike Pompeo was enraged over the exposure of the CIA's bag of tricks. The world now knows that the agency can impersonate a Russian hacker. Vault 7 followed the DNC emails in 2016, so there was bloodlust there on the part of Democrats and great support for his indictment. In my view, blaming Julian for Hillary's loss to Trump is a failure to understand the purpose of journalism in democracy. To withhold information is to interfere with the democratic process. The media's role isn't to be partisan, but that is precisely the position it takes beating war drums from the outset as they are now doing the situation created by the United States using NATO. Julian himself said choosing between Hillary and Trump was like having to choose between cholera and gonorrhea. When it became clear that Ecuador was to betray him and Russia was suggested as a country of asylum, he ruled it out knowing that he would forever 
be referred to as a Russian tool, that this was proof that Russia was behind this leak. We know that the use of the Espionage Act to prosecute a journalist and publish it for the first time is intended to set a precedent and to punish him as severely as possible without executing him, but killing him slowly, a process that began in 2011 with his vilification and arbitrary detention. While he continued to be showered with journalism, integrity and human rights awards, his successful ostracisation smoothed the way for his persecution and prosecution with great overreach to ensure precedent is set that will frighten anyone considering embarrassing the United States again. The callousness and stupidity of many of my colleagues, I'm sad to say, in their total disregard of the abuse of Julian's human rights and in their failure to understand the repercussions for all investigative journalists of this precedent has been truly mind-boggling. Not his union, though, the MEAA, not the International Journalists' Union, parliamentarians around the world and a multitude of human rights organisations, including Amnesty, uh, somewhat belatedly. The repercussions for journalism, of course, uh, impact on the health of our democracy, and that's a topic in itself. But I'd like to talk a bit about the legal process and the United States assurances. In December last year, the High Court reversed the District Court's decision refusing the US request to extradite Julian on the basis that to extradite him would be oppressive because of the risk of suicide and the likelihood he would not survive incarceration in the United States. Those of us that initially took comfort that the Chief Justice who had delivered the Laurie Love decision was sitting on this case uh, were quickly disappointed when he interrupted the Defence Council during a hearing when the Defence Council was referring to Laurie Love, whose extradition was refused, to point out that this was, oh, this was a very different case. He had eczema. Now, as Nils Melzer pointed out, you don't need the Chief Justice to have regard to a precedent, but you do need him if you want to change the precedent he himself set. The High Court agreed with the prosecutor that Baratza should have warned the United States of her potential decision so they could take action by offering assurances. In effect, the High Court reinforced the notion that the judge's role was to assist one side, to assist the United States in these proceedings. Furthermore, the High Court judges found that the assurances should be accepted because they were solemn undertakings by the US and were therefore reliable. So the High Court ruled the case should be sent back to the District Court to reverse the decision and to order extradition. The defence then had to ask the same High Court judges to certify a number of points of law of general importance that they saw in order to appeal this decision to the Supreme Court. Now, when that High Court decision was delivered the other week, Julian, I'm told, was not present and uh, was not permitted. We don't know whether he wasn't present because he was unwell or whether he was not permitted to be present. Access for journalists was scandalous for journalists outside London. We were not informed as to whether we would have access at all uh, prior to the hearing. Um, on commencement of the hearing, we received a link, but then we were left looking at a black screen with no audio. So the High Court judges certified only one of the grounds in that hearing regarding the timing of the assurances, the timing of the provision of the assurances. Now, providing assurances that can't be tested, can't be scrutinised, raises issues of procedural fairness and natural justice. The long-held approach by the courts has been to require all relevant matters to be raised in the magistrate's court. Underpinning their departure in those principles in practice is the categorization of an assurance as an issue rather than as evidence. The decision in this case is important also because it sets a new precedent whereby an assurance can be freely introduced later. So it's an issue of importance in the predictability and progression of extradition cases going forward. 
The assurances that were given, though, were not assuring in any way for a number of reasons. They came with the proviso that the US could withdraw them should they find that he's done something new that offends them, some conduct or um, uh, which can include speech or unspecified behaviour. Um, this, of course, gave rise to further grounds to object to the assurances. The two grounds on which the defence sought leave to appeal that were dismissed were, one, based on Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, that the conditions that still may be imposed are illegal. And secondly, the extreme prison conditions of the assurances bar could be imposed with no further explanation by the United States if authorities found them to be uh, justified according to the assessment of any number of US departments or agencies which could trigger their imposition. So it's not the viability of the assurances that can be appealed here because they knocked back both those grounds. It's whether there should be any scrutiny of them whatsoever or not. So the High Court is very much limiting the scope of the appeal to the Supreme Court. Craig Murray points out that it's avoiding discussions in that court that would be damaging to the United States, enabling a refusal of extradition by the UK's highest court on a technicality that avoids condemning US prison conditions in the court. So the focus is on the timing of the offer of the assurances. Julian can now seek permission from the Supreme Court to appeal the High Court's decision in the US's favour. In reality, in spite of how solemn the Chief Justice seems to regard the US assurances, the second reason they are meaningless is because we know very well that the US has reneged on such assurances in the past uh, that it has provided to the United Kingdom and to Spain. So where to from here? If Julian's appeal to the Supreme Court fails, the court will send the case back to the magistrate's court to order extradition. Julian can then counter appeal the district court's decision that Beretza was wrong not to include in her basis for rejecting extradition important issues such as the political motivation, that it's a press freedom case, um, the illegal accessing of legally privileged material, new corroborating evidence that the CIA planned to kill him, and the collapse of the so-called hacking charge after the key unreliable US witness outed himself as a liar, that he lied to the FBI. If the Supreme Court rules for Julian, he should immediately be released, except the US has already flagged that they're simply going to issue another indictment uh, or beef up the assurances. This is death by process. Julian faces another two years of this in the United Kingdom and a decade of legal process in the United States. Will he survive this? I don't think so. Will he? Uh, does, does the UN rapporteur on torture, Nils Melser, think? He certainly doesn't think so. Um, so the notion that this is all okay because the US has said he could serve out his sentence in Australia is obscene. In the best of circumstances, that would be a protracted process and depend on how inclined the Australian Prime Minister at the time might be in possibly 15, 20 years' time. Julian must never be sent to the United States. He would not get a fair trial. The jury in the eastern state of Virginia would be employees of US agencies um, or their families. The CIA plotted to kill him and spied on meetings with his lawyers and seized legally privileged material, and the CIA would have a say in the conditions he'd be held in, in prison. Anything he has said or done publicly or privately since February 2021 could be used by the United States to justify treatment that the UK courts have determined would pose a serious risk to his life. James Goodale, the New York Times attorney in the Pentagon Papers case, listed the ways that the US breached laws and court rules in that case. And he said that in this case, the assurances are not worth the paper they're written on. Uh, 
Above all, Julian can't be sent to the US because of his health, his health which has deteriorated greatly. A maximum security prison is no place for a publisher, let alone one who has already spent seven years in arbitrary detention with no sunlight, exercise or proper medical care and in a state of increasing anxiety following years of vilification and surveillance. Julian has already paid for his courage with the decade of his life and with his health. Nils Melzer said two doctors experienced in dealing with victims of torture were unequivocal. Julian was suffering from the effects of long-term torture, both psychologically and physically. After three years in Belmarsh, he is much worse. He's a shadow of his former self. I was shocked the last time I saw him in a thumbnail at the bottom of my screen during a hearing watching the High Court appeal from a video room in Belmarsh. He looked extremely unwell. He sat down to look at a computer screen and he struggled to keep his eyes open. Then he couldn't keep his head up, so he had to prop his head up in the palm of one hand and then he couldn't keep his eyes open. He was completely glazed over. His eyes were completely, so he obviously couldn't concentrate and he couldn't, he couldn't stay seated. He must have been aware that he was being watched in this state. So he just got up and moved out of sight. We got no information after that as to what happened to him. He just disappeared. Now, generally the host would be responsive and if we ask to see more of the defendant, they would accommodate it or not. But in this case, we had absolutely no information. We found out much later that Julian suffered a transient ischemic attack, in other words, a mild stroke, often a precursor to a major stroke. Now, in this case, he would need to have an MRI of the brain, which would tell you how serious it was and how likely he is to have a major stroke. But he won't have had one. Stella Morris told me recently that only a prison doctor has seen him for some time. Without a doubt, Julian is not getting the medical care that he needs. It's disgraceful that our government has not asked the US to drop the charges or advocated on his behalf to ensure that he's released. He spent three years in prison with no conviction. This is a political case and requires a political solution. And there are precedents. They intervened with David Hicks, Peter Grester, and Moore Gilbert. The district court judge decided that political motivation could not be considered because though it's a treaty provision, it was excluded from domestic legislation. And that would have to be assumed was intentional. That UK politicians have argued the extradition treaty is lopsided. And as we have seen time and time again, the United States do not extradite their own. We're seeing that at the moment with the UK in the case of Sekoulis, which has been going on for some time. Now, what can we do? I think it's very important that we don't feel impotent and that we don't feel despair. We need to be calling out the United States and the UK's hypocrisy and the shameless subservience of the UK and of our politicians here, of our government. Momentum is building up amongst human rights organisations and journalists organisations and parliamentarians around the world. There are people who put their safety and freedom and lives at risk in the service of justice, like Julian, like David McBride, who's also facing life in prison, and like Bernard Caleri. In their dedication to justice, to truth and to human rights and to democracy, all three men are as one. If they are destroyed, it will have been enabled uh, by our complacency. Einstein put it rather well. The world, he said, is a dangerous place, not because uh, of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. You are all here watching tonight because you're engaged. Uh, but our mission is to engage as many others as we can annoy the hell out of 
our politicians to take action and campaign against those who don't.